It's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Stephen Lowe from Caltech. Uh, he has been really on the cutting edge of promoting change of paradigm in operating power systems. And I think the, uh, it, it has not been easy. So we want to learn actually the vision. And also I'm sort of curious about the, your experience. How do you go from the vision to actually convincing industry that this makes sense? So hopefully you'll address a little bit of that. Well, th Steven, it's all yours. I, I don't think we need to go through any formal introduction. Everybody knows you. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Maria and Dan, for the kind invitation. Uh, it, it's a great opportunity. Thank you. Um, of course, I've been following uh, what you guys work and learning a lot in the last uh, decade. So I'll talk about learning and controlling distribution networks. And as um, uh, uh, Andy Sun uh, described last week, uh, to really drastically reduce greenhouse gas emissions, we have to electrify transportation and we have to generate electricity from clean and uh, renewable sources. And one of the important thing among many uh, is the, the role of distribution networks because that's where a lot of the smart grid uh, innovations will appear or at least will appear first. Um, it, it offers tremendous opportunities because active DERs are intelligent um, it, as well as risk because they also introduce uh, fluctuations, random fluctuations, uh, frequent fluctuations uh, in, in supply, in demand, voltage, uh, and, and frequency. So uh, that's why I want to talk about um, maybe three pieces of work. Maybe two, it depends on the time. I guess I should finish in uh, say 55 minutes or so. So I will talk first about two pieces. One is learning emissions matrix uh, of distribution network, which means that both the topologies and also the impedances on the lines. And the second piece is more uh, practical about a project that we have been working on at Caltech for the last few years. Um, and also uh, both the infrastructure that we build, which is an adaptive charging network for electric vehicles, but also a research facility built on top of this physical infrastructure. If we have time, I'll talk about a learning-based voltage control work by a former postdoc, uh, Guan Nanju, who is now a faculty at CMU WE. Okay, so the first piece, learning emittance matrix. So formally the problem, and then I would describe an exact identification of the emittance matrix Y for radio networks when the network is a tree. It's a single phase model in a radio network. So we'll see the details of that. I'll try to go slowly because I think uh, I was quite surprised um, uh, when, uh, when we have uh, this, this result. And I should also emphasize, uh, this is the work uh, mainly by Yue Yuan, who was a postdoc at Caltech uh, a few years ago, Omir Adradakhan, are the Canyon, sorry, <laughs> University of Alberta and also Claire Thomas at Berkeley. Okay, so uh, here's the model. So a network is simply a graph, uh, G, uh, the set of nodes, N and or buses, and this given uh, by the set of links or lines, um, E. And each line is parameterized by a series of mutants. So it's a single phase model, and we will assume in this work that the charging emittances are zero, which is a reasonable assumption for distribution network. So in this familiar pi model of a line, then we assume there's only a single parameter, which is a series of emittance that we try to identify. So that's the model. And the main thing that we focus on is this current balance um, in Ohm's law, where the current injection, which is a complex number ij at bus j, is simply sum of the line injection from bus j to the rest of the network, which you can express in terms of the voltage phaser. And therefore, in vector form, you get this i equals yv, where i is an n-dimensional n plus or n plus one-dimensional complex vector, v is an n-dimensional complex n plus one-dimensional complex vector, and y is n plus one by n plus one complex uh, matrix. And the important thing that we will exploit later on uh, is that Y is a complex symmetric matrix. It's not complex emission, 
where that's where a lot of problem comes in. But it's complex symmetric, and we assume it's zero row sum, and this is because we assume the charging emittances are zero. And conversely, if you're given any complex symmetric matrix with zero row sum, we can interpret that as a matrix matrix of a certain network. So by learning a matrix matrix Y will mean the following. Suppose at every node I in discrete time, we can measure the current injection I, I of T and node I at time T and the voltage phase of VI of T. For T equals one to capital T. And therefore for every time T, we have a I equals Y V formula in matrix form. Or we can turn the matrix around and look at, let's say at only node I, but across time. Then we get at node I, we have T measurements, I of one, I of two, I of T on the left, and a bunch of measurements, voltage measurements for every node, every time T. We can rearrange that so that V I of T becomes the matrix that is given because we have measurement. So I, I of T is a bunch of numbers. V, I of T are a bunch of complex numbers. And the I row, uh, the Y, the I row of Y, the emissions matrix will satisfy this linear equation. And therefore the point is that once we have the measurements at every node, every time of the current injection voltage injection, then we can write down linear equations that relates the measurements in terms of the Y matrix. And if we do some noise, and if we have perfect measurements and everything, then we could potentially recover the emittance matrix Y from the set of measurements. So a very simple idea. Okay, so just a notation, uh, V capital T with this T means that it is a T by M matrix indexed by capital T. So a transpose has a, a slightly different uh, font of the T. It's not too important, just in case uh, you wonder. Okay, so then basically, then you can formulate, for example, hello, um, the, am I, my network is okay, right? Okay, uh, it, it seems to free, to have frozen on my screen, um, but let me know. I think if, it's if okay I, with us. Okay, great. So you can formulate the learning problem, for example, as you, just look at the difference between uh, V of Y. Again, VT is, N, is T by N matrix. Uh, that's the measurement. Y is a variable. Uh, and then IT is also a matrix. And you look at the, so this is like the error matrix. And you look at the uh, L2 norm of the error matrix subject to two conditions that we mentioned about the matrix Y, which is that Y is a complex symmetric matrix and the row sum is zero, right? So you can minimize the error um, subject to these two conditions. So if the matrix has full column rent, then we can identify exact solution. By that, I mean the minimum error is zero. That, that's what I mean. So informally, if we don't have noise, then if the voltage measurements are sufficient rich, meaning that VT has full column rent, uh, then we can recover the ground truth. So that's what the implication, informal implication. Otherwise, if we have noise um, or if the matrix is not full random, then we get a certain matrix from this optimization uh, that incurs this uh, error to error. Right? So this assumes, so you, you can, from this basic setup, you can have different models and let's say different um, uh, statistical models or you can formulate different problems and so on, look at say complex complexities and these kind of issues. But I want to focus on a, perhaps a simpler problem, right? And the problem is, is the following. So in this formulation, we assume there's a measurement at every nose. And in practice, of course, we usually do not have that. So what can we do, especially on the distribution system? So that's the problem I want to focus on. So let's go down to the setup. So it's a radio network and therefore it is a tree topology. It is connected, um, so basically a tree and it is single phase. And then think of uh, that as let's say positive sequence uh, network or so on. And suppose there are each number of nodes at which we do not have measurement. So these are hidden nodes. 
So we know the nodes are there, but we don't have measurement. Okay? And n minus each of them, uh, of the nodes, we do have measurements of the voltage phaser and the current phaser, just like before. Okay? So uh, m is a set of measured nodes, and the hidden nodes will be the, the h of them, uh, n minus two plus one to n. And a important assumption we make is that wherever we do not have measurement, there's no injection. So the assumption underlying that is that if you have generation or if you have load, then typically you have some meter. So you have some measurement. So where we do not have measurements in the interior of the network, we assume that there's no injection. So that's a key assumption. There's another assumption which is sort of technical. It's not that important. Is that every hidden node where we do not have measurement has degree at least three. So it is used in some calculations later on, but it's not that important. Then I can talk about what's the implication if that is not satisfied. So that's a setup. Uh, and therefore, at every time t, we will have a set of measurements of the current injection. So I1 here denotes not the measurement at node one, but the subvector of all measured nodes. So these are the current injection at the nodes that do have measurement. Similarly, V1 of T is a subvector of voltage measurements at the set of measured nodes. And V2 is the vector of voltage phases at hidden nodes where we don't have measurement and where the injections are zero, right? So we have, we have this, uh, we have this uh, H time P will have uh, uh, this equation. And we just decompose um, the emissions matrix accordingly in partition that into this Y11, Y12, and Y22, right? It's symmetric. So Y21 is simply the transpose of Y12. So basically that's the setup. We have a set of measurements, which represents the measurements at the subset of the nodes. And we want to, again, identify the matrix. Can we do that? So that's the question. So again, each time we have this equation and what we can do is that, uh, the chrome reduced emission, emissions matrix Y bar, okay, which is given by this, which uh, we don't know. So we don't know the Y matrix and therefore we do not know the components Y11, Y12 and Y22, right? And therefore a priori, we do not know Y bar, okay? But we know Y bar is related to the original Y matrix in this way. It's defined by that. And what it represents is really, it represents the relationship between the I and the V are at the measure nodes. So pictorially, here's the picture. You have a seven node network and node seven is hidden. We don't have measurement. We have measurement on the other six. And Y emittance matrix, essentially, if you look at the underlying graph of the chrome reduced matrix Y bar, the underlying graph is this, where node four, five, six are connected, right? So we're familiar with that. So suppose we have measurements at these six nodes, and what we can do, we can formulate the problem as before, which looks like this, except that it's V1 and I1 that involve the measurements at the measure nodes only, right? But the same formulation, except now we are trying to identify Y bar, okay? And suppose, and what one thing to know is that because Y is complex symmetry, it's not real symmetry, and therefore um, there's no guarantee that Y bar uh, Y22 is invertible and therefore Y bar exists. Uh, so if this real symmetry, then it is true. For, for complex symmetry in general, it's not true. But it turns out if the lines are resistive and inductive, then you can indeed show that Y22 is invertible and Y bar exists. And, and therefore this problem is well-defined under the assumption that if the lines are resistive and inductive. And, so, and moreover, just like what we saw la last time, in a simple case where V1 T, which is this matrix, measurement matrix has full column rank, then we can identify Y bar exactly. Okay, so let's assume that. So we're, we're gonna focus on this simple case. Let's say we can identify Y bar exactly, right? So we have exact recovery of Y bar from the measurements. The question is that can we identify the original matrix Y? Okay. So we are given Y bar, can we find Y? So that's the question. So we are given this with a, uh, we're given this 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 uh, matrix. So we have done with the measurements. We are given a uh, Y bar matrix. Can we identify this matrix, both the topology and also line impedances? And surprisingly, the answer is yes. We can exactly identify Y from given Y bar, assuming Y bar is accurate. 
Okay, so which means that you can exactly recover both the topology and the impedances on the radio uh, network. And the proof is constructive. So let me give you three key ideas or key observations uh, that underlies the proof. Um, so it gives a sense of what, what, what happened. So again, the assumptions that we made, uh, with, uh, be, that we went through before is that is, it is a tree topology, is connected, single phase, uh, zero row sum and column sum of the emittance matrix Y, and hidden node, there's no injection, and every hidden node has degree three or more. Um, and we also assume we exactly, we have exactly recovered the chrome reduced emittance matrix Y bar, okay? So that's the setup. Okay, so three, um, three ideas. Uh, one is that it turns out we can decompose the current reduced emittance matrix Y bar and the corresponding underlying graph in some manner. So we'll, we'll see, we'll go into detail of each of these three observations. And that decomposition allow us to identify what we call measure nodes, both the boundary measure nodes and internal measure nodes. And the boundary measure nodes are the key. So we'll see it again what they are and why that is the case. And then that allows us to sort of recursively compute the uh, emittance matrix. Or think about what do we need to compute? Well, we need to compute the, imp we need to compute the, uh, the topology and also the emittance, emittances on the lines, which means that we have to identify the set of lines so where there is a line, and if so, what the emittance matrix on that line is. So the recursion is on the lines, as you will see, uh, that, that, that we'll see, we, we're sort of uh, computing those lines from the outside, from the outskirt of the network and towards the center, as you will see. Okay, so let's go into each one of these three. So um, let's look at two matrices, Y1 bar, Y2 bar, which are not submit, which are some matrices, Y1 bar uh, of the emittance matrix Y. So Y, is, y bar is given. From that, we form this Y1 bar and Y2 bar. So I'll be very careful. Uh, so this is sort of constructive proof, right? At each stage of the proof, what do we know and what do we don't know? So initially, we don't know anything. We don't know the com components of Y11, Y12, Y22. So these are the submatrices of the original matrix Y. So we partition the original matrix Y into four, or, or, uh, four blocks. Um, uh, y11, y12, and y22. We don't know those uh, submatrices, but we form y1 bar and y2 bar, which therefore we do not know. So even though we don't know what they are, but we know how they relate to what well, we define them to be defined by those um, uh, uh, submatrices. And, you, and then you can show that y1 bar, y2 bar are indeed complex symmetric matrices with zero row sums, which means there are some underlying graphs uh, underlying this Y1 bar and Y2 bar that we define, which we don't know yet, but we define these matrices. And Y bar, which we know, are uh, given by the sum. So given any um, complex symmetric matrices with zero sum, we can define an underlying graph. Right? Basically, if the, uh, the, the uh, matrix, the JK entry of the matrix is not zero, then there's a line. That's basically what it is. Which means that we know the matrix Y bar, and we therefore know is underlying graph G bar. We don't know Y1 bar, we don't know Y2 bar, but there are some graph G1 bar and G2 bar that underlie these two matrices, Y1 bar, Y2 bar, right? So uh, we know this, we don't know the submatrices of the original emissions matrix Y, and therefore we don't know this. However, it turns out that you can, we don't know the Y1 uh, bar, Y2 bar, but we can actually construct the, the underlying graph from this graph that we know, right? So we know Y bar, we know its underlying graph. From this graph, we can actually compute the underlying graphs of Y1 bar and Y2 bar, okay? So that's the step one we do, we construct that graph. So pictorially, what happens is the following. So this is what we see, right? This, so this is the uh, underlying graph of y bar, so this is g bar. So we know y bar, we can write down this graph, and this graph consists only of measure nodes, and therefore we know its topology. From that, you can see from this example, it decomposes nicely into two subgraphs. In one subgraph is a destroying collection of trees. In the other subgraph, 
is the destroying collection of maximal clicks plus some isolated nodes. It always breaks down into these two subgraphs. G1 is a destroying collection of trees. G2 is a destroying collection of maximal clicks with at least three nodes plus some isolated uh, nodes. And therefore, we can compute the G1, G2. And their lines, the lines in G1, the lines in G2 are destroyed. So this can be constructed, which means that we can actually construct Y1 bar, Y2 bar from the Cron reduced matrix Y bar. So if you give me a Y bar through this graph decomposition, I can come back and give you what is the Y1 bar, Y2 bar here. And Y1 bar, Y2 bar, especially Y2 bar, is going to allow us to compute some of the line admittances. Okay, so this is because um, the, G, the, the, two, the line set of the two graphs are destroyed. Okay, so that's the first observation. And therefore, this allows us to classify uh, the measure nodes into internal nodes and boundary nodes. So again, what do we know? What we, what we, all we know is this um, measure nodes. We don't know the hidden nodes. We know the measure nodes. However, we can now identify these are internal nodes, which means that these are internal measure nodes whose neighbors are only measure nodes. And these are the boundary nodes. And therefore, they, the boundary measure nodes have both measure nodes and hidden nodes as these neighbors. Right? So we don't know what the neighbors um, they, how they are connected, we, but we know this set of boundary measure nodes are connected to some measure nodes. So that's what we know. And therefore we can uh, classify the measure nodes into two sets and that's important. Okay, and therefore we can write the original matrix Y, which we have to identify. So we don't know any of these uh, matrices, but we, we know we can put them into this kind of, um, uh, this, this kind of structure, right? So, uh, this, so there's some, uh, there's some internal lines between only the mesh, internal mesh nodes, and then there are lines uh, that connects the mesh nodes to the hidden nodes. So these are the mesh nodes, and these are the hidden nodes. Um, uh, and then also there are boundary hidden nodes and internal hidden nodes. Again, we don't know them, uh, but we know there are such, such things. And what we are going to focus on is the key is to look at the um, lines that we want to identify between two boundary nodes, a boundary measure node and a boundary hidden node, as we will see later on, okay? And therefore we know now we start to have some structure on the Y, even though we don't know what, what Y uh, matrix is yet, but we know some structure already. And then the, the, the first thing is easy to show that with this structure, it turns out it's easy to identify the uh, line emittances, the connectivity of line emittances of the internal measure nodes which means these two submatrices. So why you further decompose Y1, partition Y1 into two pieces, then the pieces above. So these are the internal uh, measure nodes. Um, those, the, the line connecting among the internal measure nodes, those are easy to identify. So if you give me the chrome reduced matrix Y bar, I can identify those two. And therefore we, we can just get rid of it and look at the Y matrix, um, without those submatrices that have been identified. That corresponds to, we just ignore the internal measure nodes and we just focus on the boundary measure nodes and the set of hidden nodes that we try to identify. Okay, so that's the one implication. So the second Stephen, thing you just, get- Stephen, just the clarification question, well, I think it's important to ask it now that Masood Barati asked, uh, when you do crown reduction, you end up having shunts also. So do these claims still hold then? Yes. In other words, you go from the regular into crown reduction, you always end up shun having shunts. You may have capacitive shunts. So um, the, as long as the original lines have zero shunts, has zero charging. So if the, if, if the shunts that are at the nose, so those are fine. So those are just part of the injection. The line charging, the, ori the original line charging um, emittances, those are soon zero. Yeah, yeah. So as as, the, yeah. The question is, when you go from the, let's say, radio network to do cron reduction, you get rid of one node. You end up with three nodes, but at the shunts, you may have capacitors. I believe, and I told him to ask the question because I didn't know the answer, so that's... Yeah, I, 
okay, I, I'm not entirely sure of the question either, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that is fine. So maybe we can work out, this, look at some details offline, but I'm pretty sure that as long as the original set of assumptions are satisfied, I think that will be fine. I, I guess the question is, uh, can you recover the, uh, the Chrome reduced network from the measured nodes only? Yes. So that the assumption is that we can. Um, so if, if that, no, so, that, so there are a whole bunch of assumptions underlying that, right? So there's no noise and then the, the measurements are in some sense rich enough and those, those things. So I don't know whether the, the, the question relates to that. So we are assuming that we ignore those issues. We assume that we can recover a white bar. Now white bar could be the ground truth, could be sort of the least, uh, um, has the minimum L2 is a matrix that would give us the minimum L2. But we're gonna take that as the ground truth and say, okay, if this is the Y bar, what is the original underlying Y? So that's the question we focus on. Okay. Thank you. So yeah, sure, sure. We, we can discuss more that maybe afterwards as well. Um, okay, so, so another thing then one can show is that for the boundary hidden nodes, okay, for every, if you look at every node I, uh, it is connected to a certain set of boundary mesh nodes. And it turns out that we can identify for every hidden node I, again, we don't know what they are, but we can identify the set of me boundary mesh nodes that are connected to the same hidden node. And therefore we can say, we can look at the green nodes, right? So the green nodes are the nodes in this example, the green nodes are the nodes that are mesh nodes. So what we can identify to say that, oh, these two mesh nodes are identical, uh, uh, in fact, these four mesh nodes are connected to the same hidden node. So that we can identify. And since we only care about the boundary mesh nodes, uh, we care about these two. So we say, oh, these two mesh nodes are connected to the same hidden nodes. And this mesh node is connected to uh, a hidden node, for example, uh, by, by itself. So that we can identify. So what does that mean? It means that we can further, uh, so this, this are the structure of these two. We know these two will have this structure where y1 minus y1 hat or y1 hat is the light emittances of all the measure nodes that's connected to the first boundary node and so on. And so there are HB number of boundary nodes. Each has a, um, uh, a vector that corresponds to the set of measure nodes that's connected to that uh, hidden node. So it has this structure, y1, uh, so y1, 2, y2, 1, uh, and also y1, 1, y2, 2 will have this structure. So that allows us to do the recursion. So in the interest of time, let me just show you a, a diagram. Uh, what, oh, okay, maybe I, I, I do need to say something before that. So this is the structure. So this is the y that we want to identify. We don't know any of these submatrices. None of them submatrices are known. But we know that these first two submatrices would take this form. And therefore, to identify these two submatrices, what we need to figure out are the individual vectors, y1 bar, which again consists of, which are the line emittances of all the measure nodes connected to the first hidden node, and so on. So it turns out from y2 bar, right? Remember, we do the decomposition of the graph and we can figure out y2 bar from y bar. From y2 bar, it turns out we can compute each yi bar as long as it has um, each of this corresponding node, uh, th this hidden node has um, uh, connected to two, at least two measure nodes. Okay, so we can cal calculate that um, as long as the, the hidden nodes has uh, two measure nodes, okay? And once we figure out these two submatrices, then it has implications on stuff that we don't know. So these are the hidden nodes. So hidden nodes, these hidden nodes, we don't know. But now, given the uh, this two submatrices that were com computed now, and because of the real symmetric uh, property, we can actually figure out something of, about the hidden node. And it looks something like it looks something like this. So for for this example, it looks something like this. So we know now we know this. Uh, we don't know this, but in fact, we know something about this. We know some some matrix of the inverse of this, uh, of this uh, sub matrix. So we know something. And that allows us to treat the, the, um, 
the original boundary hidden nodes, think of them as a boundary measure nodes. And that corresponds to basically, originally we, we partitioned a network like this, but now we expand sort of the measure nodes to this. And therefore um, that gives us a recursion and then we can repeat. So let me show you a picture um, and then we'll, I'll, I'll finish this part. So this is a network where the green nodes are measure nodes. The solid green are internal nodes. The non-solid green are the boundary nodes. And the brown nodes are hidden nodes. Again, the solid uh, brown are the hidden, uh, uh, the, the internal nodes, in, internal hidden nodes, right? So uh, the solid greens are easy. So those lines connecting uh, only between mesh nodes, so that easy. So we'll, what we'll focus on are really the nodes between uh, the line between two boundary nodes, the boundary mesh node and boundary hidden node. And these are the lines we'll identify uh, through that uh, recursion. And therefore- well, Steven, Steven, there is a yeah. question and there is a counter example already. And it's actually from Rupamati Jadivada from MIT. She, recall, she reminded me, here is the question really in, in your problem formulation. At all nodes, you have also loads and assume that the load is an RL load connected in shunt at that node, that right away results after you have cron reduction, right away results in, uh, in destroying the structure that we need. So she pointed out, this is credit to her, she's very shy to talk, but she sent me a personal message here on the, uh, on the Zoom and it was on the Sharif microgrid that we worked on where we had, you had RL loads. So <clears throat> basically the point is that each, it, on the radial network, you have uh, some loads connected, even if they are RL loads, not necessarily capacitive loads, but they're connected between original nodes and the ground. Then you end up with the cron reduction, which actually has, uh, has shunts. And uh, at that point, things become uh, very much more interesting. So um, just uh, credit to Rupa. I think she figured it out in real time. Sure. Um, if I understand the question, then uh, is that what we need in that case as we need the injection, the net injection, the net curry injection. So yes, maybe, maybe yes. Is, is that right. So I will not be able to identify the topology that corresponds to the, let's say the, the shunt elements of RL nodes inside that node. So that I will not be able to identify. Yeah, so that is actually the point because right. a lot of these, these um, radial networks, they have loads, right? Sure, sure. So, no, I agree. Um, okay. Th those behind that meter, I, I cannot. What I take okay. is that, yeah. Okay, great. Great, thank you. Uh, sure, sure. Uh, agree. Okay, so, um, and, and, and therefore, the, um, the, in the first round of the reduction, what we can identify are the lines here, the lines between the boundary nodes, uh, these lines. Right. And therefore these lines after one iteration becomes green. I, I have identified these guys. And therefore I can think of the boundary hidden node in the past. Now I think of them as the boundary measure nodes now. And therefore I have in one iteration, I sort of go in one circle, uh, right? And then I, I just repeat, I look at the lines between boundary nodes, which are these lines, uh, these lines, and then next iteration, I come to this picture. So the only lines now, uh, they are not identified here are this. So one more iteration, I identify the whole, whole network. So, so that's, the, that's the idea. Okay, so that's the first part. Um, if there's any quick question on, on the first part, um, I can answer them now, otherwise I go to the second part. Okay, so the second part is a, a um, project that we'll be working on at Caltech is adaptive charging network um, and also a research facility on top of that. It's uh, many work by my former PhD student Zach Lee and um, Sonas Sharma, who is now pursuing PhD at, at Berkeley with uh, Duncan uh, and uh, current PhD student Thompson Lee. And also many people have uh, contributed to this project over the years. I just want to acknowledge them, um, especially the engineering team and the founders at uh, the Caltech uh, startup PowerFlex and all the students and uh, visitors over the years. Okay, so I'll, let me describe the physical infrastructure, adaptive charging network, and then uh, adaptive charging network research portal uh, built on top of that. Okay, so 
many reasons for EV charging and for workplace EV charging. So we are familiar with the dark curve and this is the dark curve uh, last year. And if we want to just fill the valley, we can charge 13 million EVs today. And California has a commitment of having now, it has been revised up. Uh, it was 50%, but now it's 60% renewables uh, by 2030 and 100% by 2045. So it's clean electricity. And then uh, 5 million EVs by 2030. So that's the commitment. And also there's some survey that shows that if workplace charging is available, then drivers are twice as likely uh, to get EVs. Uh, and therefore there are many reasons why we want to do workplace charging. That's where the cars are either at home or at workplaces. So the physical system that we build uh, consists of um, two 150 kVA uh, transformers uh, coming from the electric room at the, at the garage. Uh, and then there's some panels and switches. And so on. eventually uh, these are the smart chargers. So this is uh, a smart charger, first generation smart charger. A former student, uh, George Lee, who is the co-founder of the company uh, who built based on open source um, chipsets. So once we build this, uh, we thought, oh, maybe we can try out some of the ideas and, 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 we, and to build this system, uh, this physical system. The cyber system uh, is also quite simple. When a driver plugs in her car, uh, uses, she uses a mobile app to tell the system two pieces of information. How much energy do I need? So I need 30 miles. When do I need to depart? Say expected at 5 p.m. this afternoon, let's say. So the system knows all the energy demand and departure time or expected departure time of every EV in the system. Uh, it communicates in real time, um, the information to the cloud and every two minutes, a minute or two, it form a quadratically constrained quadratic program and solve it in an MPC style. So it will form a uh, optimization problem the solution of which would tell you the exact charging rate for every EV in the garage for the next minute or next control interval, say two minutes or five minutes. And then uh, it repeat the cycle. So this optimization problem is convex. There's no power flow. Right? So it's a quadri quadratic constraint quadratic program based convex. It is cus very customizable. So you can have different objectives depending on the site host some may want to charge in a way that minimizes its electricity bill. Some may want to maximize uh, utilization of its on-site PV generation, or some may just want to charge cars as soon as possible. And there's also some regularizations that you can build into the objective function. Uh, the constraints consist of, you want to give enough energy for everyone before their deadline. Uh, there's a capacity constraint on say the transformers, the, search, um, the breakers and the lines and so on. And also, uh, so that determines the charging rates for all EVs by solving this QP, uh, QCQP in a model predictive control manner. So that's the base, basic uh, system. So the, uh, it was first energized in uh, February, 2016. Uh, it's a, it was a test bed. Uh, so we tried different things, things break, but people charge for free and therefore people are very tolerant. Um, and so that's George and his brother. Um, okay. Uh, it, originally, it's only uh, 54, now they have a lot more. Uh, the first generation, uh, George also put in all kinds of advanced sensor into that box that measure everything. Um, uh, it was operational since 2016 as a test bed uh, by July, 2020, I guess uh, before COVID or around COVID, uh, is, has delivered one gigawatt hour of electricity, about 3 million miles. Uh, and then uh, we started a company and then uh, it, uh, it, uh, it's de deployed various places. Uh, it was acquired by EDF. Uh, so this is a, a French uh, utility companies, utility company. So let me just show you some pictures. Um, so this is a picture, uh, January, 2018. Uh, this is time and this is a charging rate in amps. Each uh, color curve corresponds to the charging profile of AEV and you stack them up. So you can just see that this. So this is a, um, uh, a NREL deployment, November 2018. Uh, and the goal was to do demand charge for those of, of you know. So this is the, um, the net demand. So you can see the dark curve 
uh, during weekends. So at net demand, there's not a lot of building low. You get you see this very clear and nice dark curve. During weekdays, you, you still see a dark curve, but uh, you have more building low. And the goal is to control the EV so that the uh, the total, the net low building low minus PV plus EV is controlled under under 40 kilowatts. So indeed you can do that. You, you can indeed do real-time control um, quite well. The impact of um, impact of uh, COVID. So that's the inf infrastructure. Um, before November 2018, is a test bed. We do all kinds of stuff and breaks, things breaks and all that. But afterward, November 18, it transitioned into a commercial operation. And therefore we no longer can do uh, these kind of things. And therefore the idea is to build a um, software layer on top of the physical layer to provide three things that are hopefully useful for research. One is the ACN data, one is a, uh, a Ulytic simulator, and one is a live test bed, which is not complete, uh, unfortunately. Let, let me describe uh, each of these three. So um, the first, for see the ACN data is that in real time, we will collect all the charging data, we'll clean them, anonymize them, and then we put it on the web so everyone can access them. So the charging data consists not just the session data like the energy deliver uh, and also the, the actual departure time, for example, but the actual charging rate in amps every 10 seconds or so. So it's a fine grain charging data. It's growing daily. Uh, by October 2020, it's a 53,000 charging sessions. It's publicly available. So everything is, um, is uh, open source uh, and available. Uh, it's a real, uh, real time fine grain data, and you can use it for model for modern user behavior, for example, to evaluate your charging algorithms or your pricing algorithm, for example. Um, you can use it to evaluate what is the flexibility of your charging facility, given a certain capacity, for example, of your, say, transformers and breakers and so on. You can evaluate if you have a distribution grid with lots and lots of these charging, uh, smart charging garages, what is the impact on the grid? Can you use it to help stabilize the voltage, for example? So here are just some, some more pictures uh, at Caltech uh, and JPL. You can look at the data and say, oh, it's very flexible or the drivers are very flexible or not. Right? Flexible means that there's a lot of time compared with the energy demand that the driver needs. You can use it to evaluate how flexible the facility itself is. So for example, at Caltech compared with uncontrolled uh, charging, you can save almost four times uh, the infrastructure. This is the peak rate, which corresponds to the infrastructure you need to accommodate. Uh, at JPL, is again, uh, three, more than three times savings. Uh, so user behavior, you can see that when we start charging uh, payment, uh, then the, uh, uh, the charging sessions, the number of sessions drops, uh, and then this is COVID. You can look at, for example, the energy demand and the departure time. You can look at the distributions. And one thing you can see that, for example, you, the arrival times have larger variance uh, after COVID. So it's a more flexible hour. Uh, so those are only the session data. Uh, this is the uh, actual charging rate. So every 10 seconds or so, you have a charging rate for every EV in the garage. Um, so one thing we thought, is that even though we have 35,000 charging curves, they really are generated by a small number of, uh, say, employees and, and visitors uh, use uh, from small number of um, cars and batteries. And therefore, we should be able to classify them into a few types, for example. Well, that's not that easy, it turns out, because the problem is that we don't know the SOC. Um, and, and therefore, um, we have to look at the characteristics of typical charging curves and try to identify those characteristics from the charging curve. And then with that, we try, uh, you can classify them. So extracting those uh, charging tells where the characteristics are uh, is, is non-trivial. And then uh, that affects how we cluster, but how we cluster also affects how we um, extract those charging tells. So it, it, it makes a really nice uh, learning problem. Uh, uh, it has some unique features. So the, that's ACN data. ACN sim, we build a realistic simulator where uh, we have a simulator that models the charging network, the uh, chargers, the, the EV behavior, the battery behavior. You can have different models of battery with different degrees of fidelity. 
and whatever constraints you, you have in the garage, um, we integrate that with the ACN data. So the ACN, the real time ACN data can actually drive the simulation. You can also have other, uh, other signals such as utility tariffs, such as solar generation on site or on Cal ISO, for example. And then there's an the interface uh, so that let's say you come up with a new charging algorithm, you don't have to build all these underlying uh, simulation uh, facilities. You can just interface with the network and you can evaluate your algorithm, for example. Um, and again, it's, it's, it's all open source extensible. So hopefully people, uh, someone might, might be motivated to use it and or even uh, contribute back uh, to, to the code. So underlying the same interface, we can replace the simulator by the actual cars in Caltech Garage. So that's the idea of ACN Life. And therefore, if you have tested, you've analyzed your algorithm, tested your algorithm, and then if it works well, then you can use the same interface, nothing to change with the algorithm, you can test it on the uh, ACN Life. So that's the idea. We have to design, but the implementation is not complete. Um, so the idea is that the ACN Life will receive your charging command. You will test whether it is safe. If it is safe, then you will pass your command to charge the actual car, get the state measurement, and then pass the information back to your algorithm, and then your algorithm can continue. If your command is not safe, then we just use uh, whatever the charging rate for the next period, the next control period in the current PowerFlex system and to continue to charge the car. So it makes sure um, the, uh, it is safe. So again, it is open source and extensible. Um, so you can find more information at this website. Uh, Zach is still sort of um, maintaining the, the network, but please, if it's useful for you, that's fantastic. If you're motivated to um, help uh, take uh, the project, any aspect of the project um, forward, that would be fantastic. Uh, please do let me or let Zach know. So, okay, maybe I will spend 10 minutes quickly to go through a, a really nice piece of work by Guan Anqu on learning based voltage control. Uh, okay, so the problem is familiar. Uh, when we have a loss of EVs and PVs and all of that, uh, the voltage uh, may be violated and we want to uh, control it uh, so that it, it satisfies the limit. So a lot of progress over the last uh, decade or more on this problem. Uh, let me skip that. And in, in, in a lot of these um, models, including our own uh, on this work, um, we assume we know the topology, we know the line parameters. <laughs> so that's the, uh, the first part is about. Uh, and then we typically also use linearized uh, model, in particular, linear, linearized disk flow model uh, out of Berkeley from uh, Felix Wu and uh, uh, Brown, uh, with Super Brown, uh, back in 1989. So it's a really nice model. Um, so what Guan I want to look at is what if we don't know the topology, nor the line parameters, and what if the system is actually nonlinear, which of course in real system, real systems are nonlinear, right? So what happened? Can we can what can we do? So that's the problem that he focused on. So there's no model and there is nonlinearity. So his idea is to use uh, real-time feedback to learn the model implicitly and track the Jacobian implicitly to deal with nonlinearity. So that's the two ideas. So let me go into a bit of, uh, of uh, detail on his, on his ideas. So uh, the problem formulation is that you have, we have a network and this is the power flow level, it's a power flow time scale. So it's steady state uh, is described by some nonlinear power flow model, which we do not know, right? Which means that if we, pass in, uh, given the input, which is the vector of reactive power at each time, say discrete time interval, we have a control of reactive power at certain no, uh, subset of nodes. Given this vector, the network will solve these nonlinear unknown power flow equations and produce a voltage vector at every node in the network. So suppose we have that measurement. So that's the assumption. We have the voltage measurement of the network. So that's the simple model, right? So the close loop model. And our goal is to choose Q of T, the control, so that when it converges, the limit point will solve this optimization problem. So it's some kind of a cost of control um, subject to that the voltage satisfy the limit, um, the voltage limit 
uh, in equilibrium, right? So this is steady state, meaning that in this feedback system, assuming it converges, then the limit point will be a solution of this optimization problem. Now, the whole issue is that V of Q is nonlinear and it is unknown, that's the issue, okay? So how do you solve this? So this is nonlinear, non-convex, it's unknown. Okay, so how do we think about this? Well, let's start with what we know. So suppose we do have a linearized model. So this is the linearized this row model. It's linear in the control Q. P is the uh, real power injection we assume is known. So it's some constant. Uh, okay, so this is constant and this is the control. Q is the only control that, so it's linear. If the system is linear, which it is not, but if it is linear, then we know what to do. And this is the uh, model. Now we have, a linear piece plus a non-linear piece, which we don't know, right? So this is a general model because we can just take the actual measurement V minus what we think the linear model is. That difference is this unknown linearity. So it's a very, very general model, um, but it's structured black box, meaning that uh, this is arbitrary, but not purely arbitrary. We assume V of Q, which is this unknown function is Lipschitz with a certain constant and it's Jacobian or derivative is also Lipschitz with L bar. So that's the assumption. You could be anything as long as it satisfies these Lipschitz conditions. So that's the model. Okay. Um, so, so what do we do? Well, let's look at the case when everything is linear and we know everything. So what do we do? Well, here's the design of um, Guanan's previous work. So you, you can update, you can do this. Essentially, you look at the um, uh, the optimization problem, since you know everything is linear, then you can look at the dual decomposition and then you look at the dual ascent problem and this, it takes this form. So this is the primal variable, which is the control Q of T. And this is the dual variable, uh, which you update according to the gradient. Um, and the important thing is that this X vector uh, shows up from your model. And that's the Jacobian of the function V with respect to the control Q. So if I know the model is linear, I know the X matrix and therefore I can just execute this. And in fact, if you execute this, when I shows that it works, that it converges and it converges to the right optimal, okay? So what happened now we don't know X, so that's the issue. Well, if we don't know X, what we can do is we can estimate X. So we are gonna compute a matrix X hat. And the idea is that we will compute this X hat from the data. So we don't know the model, but we have measurement. We use the measurement, compute some kind of X hat. And what we need is the X hat is to sort of estimate of the Jacobian. So you need to track the Jacobian. So that's the, that, that's the, that's the key. So the first thing he showed is that no matter how you compute X hat in the next slide, if your X hat has a bounded error, meaning that the, the difference between X hat and the Jacobian matrix, the actual Jacobian matrix, which we do not know. But as long as if the error is bounded in some manner, then things will work, okay? So that's the idea. So the issue is how do we make sure you have this bounded tracking error, okay? So how do we ensure? Okay, so here's how you will compute the X hat, okay? So you update X hat based on the measurements V. And then there's a bunch of other uh, things that you have to compute along, along the way. And it is also some excitation noise to make sure the data is sufficiently rich, sort of, okay? So, so he designed this um, uh, uh, tracking its head computation, which then they use in the original control, okay? Then what he showed is that, um, oh, okay, so, th so the idea of the design is that you can think of the way you are choosing its head is the following. You look at, at each time t, all the past observations, all the measurements of your v's and, and everything. What you want to do is you look at the cumulative error, but exponentially weighted, uh, weighted error of all the past error up to time t. So this mu is the weight, and then this is the error uh, at each time. And that you want to choose a single matrix that will minimize that error. So that's the idea of how you compute the X hat at each time T, okay? And the error each time will consist of two components. It's supposed the error due to nonlinearity and the error due to the excitation noise that you implicitly, uh, you explicitly inject into the system. So both will give you error. But if you uh, choose your estimate of the Jacobian 
uh, to minimize sort of weighted, uh, weighted average of your, all your past error, then you can show that indeed um, it satisfies the tracking error uh, theorem that uh, Guanan showed before. Okay, so, and therefore you can combine the, this result with the meta result and show that that system that he designed indeed works. As long as the step size uh, that you use to update your dual variable is sufficiently small, then every limit point of your control, which is Q of T, primal variable, and the lambda T, which is a dual variable that you update uh, using uh, ADA, uh, every limit point of this pair is primal and dual optimal. So uh, let me just close with the simulation. So this is SCE 56 plus distribution circuit. Um, if you look at the, um, the case where the network is nonlinear, but you assume it is linear. So suppose I assume it is linear and it's just, just apply my linear control. Then this is the cost um, of the original dual ascent controller. Uh, and this is the proposed approach. And this is the optimal of your optimization problem. So you can see that the proposed approach actually converge to the optimal. These are some voltage profiles under the proposed control and it's, uh, it's all uh, under, within the limit. So that works. Um, so it's, it's a learning based feedback uh, voltage control uh, that will handle unknown models and also some nonlinearity. It is some because it does require a, this is, uh, some vicious conditions on the unknown voltage function and is Jacobian. Okay, um, I'm done. Thank you so much. A, a little bit over time. Thank you very much, Stephen. We have a lot of questions and very little time left. So we can go over the hour, but within the hour, I want to sort of generalize the questions in one question, the way I've seen it on the admittance matrix um, estimation. People are asking what would be the, what would be the sort of killer application, Ming Lu, Lu said, um, when under the assumptions that you have made, uh, and I think she claims that utility is actually no parameters of the admittance matrices in distribution system, which I don't know if that's true or not. So I think it's sort of at the academic level uh, raises the question of, which propagates through the entire thing that you've talked about. If we make, our theoretical assumptions so that we can solve things, how can we bring them closer to relaxing like you had in the learning-based voltage control? Um, for example, that's my area. The minute Jacobian changes its uh, positive definiteness, probably this fails, you know? So I think there are all these things that um, are disconnects between the theoretical assumptions which make the problem formulation nice. And once one goes into the industry and they start asking all these questions, how do we, do, the, the idea that I, I am understanding from you is that that can be overcome big way through learning. Is okay. that correct? Sure, sure. It's a, it's a great question, it has multiple aspects. Let me first acknowledge that the distance between Indeed, theory and practice is huge, as we all know. Right? And therefore, I guess the first part and the second part is very different. Like in the second part, uh, we, we actually did a new system. Um, uh, the, the focus and everything is very, very different. And therefore, the first comment is simply, indeed, the distance is huge. Uh, the, the second comment, uh, indeed, is that um, I, I think they, um, they, they have, I guess, uh, it's a, a little bit uh, philosophical question that then what is the value of the theories and so on? So we can discuss that offline, uh, uh, but uh, uh, as, as uh, I guess we, we, we probably agree on, on, on something that despite the distance, there's still uh, multiple values on, on the theory side. It doesn't mean that we can develop the theory in the algorithm and then we just, <coughs> just blindly transfer to, uh, to a practical problem. It's never that case. And, and therefore, um, there's a philosophical thing that we, maybe we can discuss offline. Um, and the third comment is, is that indeed, um, I think the first piece, I think the, uh, uh, the nice thing is that it, it does clarify some of the properties, structural properties of the network that offer some hope. 
But again, there is a big distance. The, and the first thing is some of the issues that you raise, uh, let's say the line uh, charging emittances may not, uh, may not be able to, uh, uh, the assumption that their zero may not be accurate enough. Uh, there are also measurements we may not be able to identify uh, accurately the Y bar matrix. There's also three phase, right, for, for um, unbalanced three phase for distribution networks. How do we deal with all of those? So those are the barriers before we can actually think about applications. So those barriers need to be solved and they are not uh, at this point. So Steve, I would like to ask my personal sort of positive take at how we bridge the gap between the theory and practice. For example, in your formulation for voltage, we assume that reactive power is controlled. Well, it's not controlled. Doesn't that open a real opportunity to say, well, the community should develop uh, nonlinear controllers for provable performance of reactive power in certain ranges and sort of go back to vendors and say, this is the next generation of controllers that we need. In other words, I think at this late age in my career, I sort of feel that there is room to, to identify through the sort of clean theoretical formulation to identify what should be technological advances and controllers on different things so that you actually have some provable performance on these power systems. We have never had them provable. So um, uh, for example, we are pushing the big idea of nonlinear controllers for uh, controlling the rate of change of reactive power. For example, this is on power electronics rate. Um, what is that worth to the, uh, to the end users? I think what is worth is that if you have such controller, then you have some guarantee that the, um, that the, the expectations within certain ranges of operating conditions, the, the performance will be uh, as expected. And so we have had this gap between provable performance and not probable performance in power systems. When you want to, you know that well, when you go to the industry and say, I want to do something new, says it for sure. And so one way is, I think, from these very clean, elegant formulations to identify what other technological advances are needed so that we actually have provable performance in power systems. It's a little bit roundabout what I said, but I think it's quite important because this is the first time with sensors, with controllers, with maturity of IOTs and so forth that people can actually uh, guarantee some performance and have advances in technology at the gadgets levels, and we are not doing much of that. So I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, so I, I completely agree. <laughs> uh, okay. So yeah, so so I I, I think seriously, um, right? So th this um, uh, I, I think the theory, as you suggested, the the value is not necessarily that it gives you an algorithm that you can just blindly apply implement. But it gives you a structure, it gives you clarity how you think about problems. And so that, as you say, you can identify what are important things to, to focus on and so on. From that, you can look at the practical problems and develop whatever is necessary within that structure. And then if the theory, the, the clean from assumptions and everything is satisfied, we know we have guarantee. Now, of course, yes. in practice, most likely you don't. But the hope is that if you get the structure right, the, the, what you build is robust enough that we cannot prove anything, but it's, it's probably going to work better. I, I think more robustly, the important thing is more robustly. But I think that there's another thing that is important. Very often with the structure, you actually come up with a design that is actually simpler. Yeah, that absolutely, order. yes. Yeah. yeah, so thank you very much for this presentation. I think it's, uh, this is just more for the community. We've had all, at one point we had like 90 people listening to you, Stephen. So, People are very interested very in these elegant formulations. And uh, um, I think it's a different era in power systems now for a variety of reasons that my own message is that we should actually look into technologies that have probable performance and then identify, okay, this is this weak assumption. Well, I can fix it many different ways with technologies. So the bottom line question at the end is you go to the vendor and say, can you make these new controllers? And they'll say, well, I have the old ones. Nobody's paying for different ones. So just one liner. And I know you have worked and many people have worked on that. How do we deri uh, derive the incentives for these new technologies that have probable performance and how much is to be gained there? I don't see much effort on that. So 
do you do you see any hope for next generation controllers and stuff? Right. So yeah, Newsport also has a lot of thoughts on this. So well, um, I, I can only talk about uh, maybe some some uh, direct experience, which is very local. So we work with a um, uh, local utility company, Pasadena Water and Power. Indeed, um, they are interested. In fact, uh, interested in using some of these new technologies. For example, they have voltage problems. Instead of a traditional solution, they are now trying to deploy batteries, for example. Mm -hmm. And what we help them with is to say uh, where to place those batteries and how, how do you control the charge and discharging. Uh, so they, they are implementing the solutions that we recommended, but as you would expect, um, they cannot implement entirely because it turns out the batteries that they buy, you cannot do a real-time monitoring control. So they are talking to the manufacturers. Um, right. They are working with them and trying to do you may not be able to provide all the real-time communication computing we need, but they're trying to, to close the gap. And therefore, I guess it's one small example that shows indeed uh, there is hope that the industry is slowly- um, Converging. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. I think this was great. Very much appreciated. Thank you everybody for listening. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.